The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to the Ben Heck Show. We are getting back to the Logic Gate board game build this week. Ben, where do we stand? Well, in a previous episode, we decided that we were going to use an LCD screen mm. to simulate multiple different types of circuits and gates instead of just trying to have a whole board of it. Yeah, I think that'll make it uh, much easier to design the puzzles and the layout of all of the, just like the gameplay in general. I think it'll be good. Right, so we need to figure out a way to drive that LCD screen. Now, I've been doing some research. Uh, Microchip has a library for its PIC32 microcontrollers. It's called LCC, Low Cost Controllerless. Hmm, okay. Um, basically, it allows us to drive an LCD using just a microcontroller and its internal RAM. Hmm. Now, we have a dev board for the new PIC32 MZ series, uh, many of which have half a megabyte of RAM, which is actually quite a bit for a microcontroller. So I think we can try to use that. So we're gonna use MPLAB X, Harmony Configurator, and the PIC32 MZ series. And we're gonna try to get it to drive an LCD screen. Sounds good. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. Should we take it for a spin? Inspired designs. Imhotep's priests. Regrettable acting. No one seems to get it. Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. I was looking at the libraries and it says that 8-bit mode does not work, which kind of sucks because that means we have to use more memory, but we should have enough. So I'm gonna rewire this for 16-bit mode. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, you can't divide 16 by three evenly. And you're right. So it's five, six, five mode. Five bits of red, six bits of green, and five bits of blue. The reason why whenever there's a non-even number of bits for the three colors, they always add the extra bit to green. Well, the reason they do that is because humans are more perceptive to the color green than the other colors because of when we had to like watch out for dinosaurs in the woods and like look at the green leaves and all the shades of green. I think that's why. All right, well, I'm gonna wire this up to the full 16-bit uh, extended bus interface port and then we can test it with the new interface. I did some more work with trying to figure out this graphics library and I learned a few things. I also did some work with this. I got everything onto one board. It's not quite as neat as I'd like, but uh, I realized that the adapter board here has jumpers. Because before I was like, oh, why isn't, uh, you know, PMD11 the same as EBI11? Well, actually it is. You just have to put the jumper in there so it's connected. So I can just plug that in. Oh yeah, great. All right, let's go and open the project. Okay, well, this Harmony, it's powerful, but oh my gosh, it can take a long time to get, to get it figured out. There's almost uh, too much documentation for it. It's all over the place and it's really hard to say, okay, where do I start? And then if you do find the master document, it's something like, I'm not kidding, like 8,000 pages long. I'm saying it's literally 8,000 pages long. Not, oh man, I had to read that book in school and it was like a million pages long. All right, so you see we have source files here and then we have app, framework, and third party. Okay, so framework, is references to the recursive libraries that we talked about. Those files do not appear in your actual project file. Sometimes it finds its way to the Harmony folder, but sometimes it doesn't. So I've noticed the best chance for compiling this correctly is to put your application in the apps folder inside of Harmony so it can recursively go up and then back down to find the right files. All right, so your actual files are an app. Oh, there's also H files separated as well. Oh, I don't really like how it does that because it just makes, it just puts everything in two different places. Because the H files are usually right next to the C files in the file structure, but here they're, they're separated out. All right, so we have app and main and system config. So app and main kind of never change. Main is always ex executed first. So you see main, okay, we initialize the system and then we loop the system tasks. So that's really all it does. So system, you know, really the heart of it is gonna be under system config. Now, if you have multiple configurations, you would see multiple folders here. This one's set up for the one of the dev boards. Uh, if you don't set a configuration, this folder will just say default. And you should see that over here as well. So if I dive into source, system config, then we see the 
uh, yeah, that d definition of the board. Okay, BSP, that's board support package. Um, so for instance, like on this board, it has three LEDs and three switches, and the board support package, if you enable that, it will give you functions to use those things immediately. Um, these are always here, system exceptions, initiation, uh, or <laughs> initiation. It's gonna initiate it into, into the fraternity. No, initialization, I don't know, why, why don't they spell out initialization? They spell out interrupt. Maybe they, oh, who knows why they do it. So here's what's called by the main function. Yeah, it does a lot of setup for the DMA or anything else that you've enabled. Enables the clocks, enables the board support, which is basically just, you know, functions like, oh, here's your LED, here's your switch. Uh, this example uses an I2C driver. We don't really need that. DMA is important because that's what actually drives the screen. It initializes the graphics, the GFX, which is actually the low level libraries. Oh, then initializes more DMA. And then finally, it initializes the ARIA library. And that's what we'll probably be looking at today. And then finally it says app initialize. So once it does that, <laughs> it goes into system tasks. And this is a loop, it's just a loop. Look for the messages, look for the touch. We haven't put the touch screen in yet, but we probably will. Update the graphics, the low level graphics library, update the high level graphics library, and finally app tasks. App tasks is under app, and there's a simple state machine. So first you initialize the app, which really does nothing. Oh wait, I guess we're turning on the LCD here. Great. Actually, I don't think we really need to do that there. We check to see if the app is initialized, it is. And then right here is where your application uh, would go. So if we wanted to do some sample code, like with the switches, we could put it right there. I'm not going to because we don't really need to for this example. Okay, framework folder. There's two things in it. There's graphics and system. So system is your clock, device controller, and your ports. Okay, here's where the magic happens. There's driver, which is just the low cost controller, this driver that only has one file in it. This is what executes uh, from the interrupt. It does LCD display refresh. This basically does everything. It's a state machine, and there's basically four DMA transfers. There's the back porch, the active pixels, the front porch, and then the HSync pulse. So it does one, two, three, four data transfers. Although during the front and back porch, it just, it doesn't put any actual data onto the uh, data lines because there's no visible image there. So the thing that we found previously was that it creates this board support package, LCD, HSync, on, off functions. But we don't actually have that dev board. We rolled our own because I had this laying around. These are cheap and the dev boards are actually kind of expensive. They're like 150 bucks usually. So I was like, hey, I'll just make my own and deal with the consequences. Uh, yeah, so that basically just does the, you know, basically puts pixels on the screen. To actually make graphics, you have a couple libraries here. HAL, which is the hardware abstraction layer. This is a very low level library that basically you draw circles, lines, uh, blitz data onto the screen. And then library aria, lib aria. Lib At first I thought this was a library, but no, it's library aria. Again, these names are really confusing. Uh, this one's kind of important because like if we look into initialization, this is what you know gets called in the uh, main setup routine. This is what's actually creating a display, like a test display. Uh, yeah, so that's how the folders work in MP Lab X. Harmony, any, anything that can be changed by you or gets changed as part of your Harmony configuration is all gonna be inside app and then framework and third party. Uh, you shouldn't have to change those. They're just showing them because they're like, hey, you're using these files. I have created some graphics that could be used for a logic gate board game. I mean, it's pretty simple. We just have a, uh, a background here. Now remember this is, you know, it's gonna be like vertical like this. So I'm actually gonna take the screen and put it vertical right now. I will ironically prop it up with a pick kit programmer. Then we have some uh, gates. I just, you know, clip these off the internet. We'll redraw these properly. But what we'll do is we'll have spacing on the main graphic that will line up to where the plugs are on the side of the screen. And then we'll make sure that the gate graphics are a certain size so they always fit between two of the plugs. So we have inputs and outputs. But we're just gonna do an example now where we can, uh, you know, just make it do something. All right, display manager. Okay, so that's our screen. We have this, this is all working, so that's good. I noticed I didn't need 38 back porch lines. Two was just fine. Accidentally didn't type 38, just left two in there and it still works, so fine by me as long as it works. Uh, let's go to graphics composer. Okay, so this display gra diagram, this represents the screen and the porches that we talked about earlier, but this actually represents what's going to show up when you start up the system. Now you can do a whole like scripting library with this, so you could have events based Based off touch control and widgets and buttons and you don't even really need to make any code. Now I want my code to be a little bit more low level than that but we can use this as an example of how we're going to get started. All right so let's 
draw some things. Okay, we want this to be persistent and create at startup. And so this is actually gonna show up back here. Remember these files we talked about? Then we have framework, graphics, lib area. <laughs> this part of the library is setting up the screen. And then right here, we're setting up the layer, which is we're about to draw. So you're creating a screen, then putting the layer on it, and then putting objects on it. Now, a lot of this is kind of overly done. I think I want mine to be a little bit more low level so I know what the heck's going on. Uh, but this is a good place to start. All right, uh, let's do it. Let's do, let's do an image. Okay, so that's a square. All right, let's try to get an image. Uh, oh yeah, we have to go into the asset manager. So this is kind of cool. We can preload images into the internal flash memory. So this particular microcontroller has 512K of RAM and two megs of flash storage. So we can put the images basically as static uh, flash memory. All right, so I have a background and or an XOR. So I can just add these in from my computer. Um, it's supposed to be able to do JPEG and PNG, portable network graphics. I wanted to use PNG because PNG is compressed, but it's a lossless compression. It basically just uses RLE, run length encoding. So if there's a bunch of transparency in your image, like you know a trend, the background of, a, of an OR gate, that all gets basically gets uh, compressed out. Unlike a JPEG, which is lossy compression, which isn't gonna look as good. But right now, PNG isn't working. JPEG is, so I'm gonna use JPEG for my example. You can even import fonts, it's pretty cool. Strings of text, it's time for them to pay. Oh, this is cool. Um, you can add extra languages. So you can have built in bilingual, well, more than bilingual, you can have trilingual. <laughs> Yeah, so you can add a language here. Uh, yeah, you go to ABC. So I could add, um, you know, uh, French. You go. So any text that appears on the screen, you can have different languages and then you can just change one setting in the global system and it'll automatically change all the languages. It'll drop it down to French, Spanish, English. I don't know if it can do Chinese. I don't know if it has the symbols for that, but uh, but you know, for a retail product that will have text on the screen, that could be quite useful. Uh, I don't think we, well, we don't need French right now. Oh no, I deleted the whole text string. That's okay. All right, let's go. We're gonna name it text. Okay, and we're gonna have it say course, hello world. So it actually can import TTF fonts and turn them into data sets so you can basically embed them. Okay, that should be enough assets. So let's go back to the designer screen. So let's make this an image. We're gonna make it take up the whole screen. Uh, looks like the size isn't quite right. It should be uh, 272. Uh, now with graphics, uh, size and position sometimes are, well, not sometimes, are basically always a little different. You might say, oh, something is 480 pixels wide. That's its size. But on the screen, it's actually gonna go from zero to 479. I remember that from the 8-bit days. All right, let's select that JPEG as the main background. Hey, look at that. Okay, cool. All right, let's add a few more things. Oh, uh, let's add some, well, let's put some images in first. Now, this isn't a... PNG. If it was a PNG, the transparency would come in handy because it would uh, it would not draw over the background. But again, these aren't our final graphics anyway. One thing kind of annoying about this graphics composer is you can't just copy paste stuff. Like you can't just take this and go copy paste. So that's well, undo, undo doesn't work either. It's not a complaint. It's a critique of missing features. Uh, all right, let's put some uh, text on it. Now you're supposed to be able to rotate this. Like you can say, oh, the screen's gonna be at 90 degrees. I haven't gotten that working yet. So the text may not be in the right orientation. So this is gonna be a label box and we'll select the text string, hello world. All right, uh, let's save this configuration. Let's set the code. It's regenerating the code. All right, let's take a look at the libaria initialization <laughs> file. All right, here's the screen itself. I want to get it rotated, but you know, we'll figure that out later. Which would be cool because then you could have zero, zero here, zero, well actually it'd be one or 271, zero. Yeah, you know, it'd be cool if this was zero, zero instead of that, but we'll figure that part out. I know there's a way to do it. Okay, so we create our new layer, which we've done, and we're putting some images on it. So we have the background. Um, I don't think it's really efficient to use one image for the entire background. It'd probably be easier to use two separate images for the, you know, the connection points on the side. Again, you know, that's graphics, user interface stuff, that's down the road. And here are our three gates. So we're creating a, a new widget, which is what they call pretty much anything on the screen. It has a position, size, uh, whether or not there's a background, whether or not there's a border, what it is. Uh, if you look at this right here, 
See that ampersand? It's kind of confusing, there's an ampersand right in front of the word and. Uh, that's a memory pointer. So this is actually gonna show up in, let's see where this is. There it is, graphics assets. So what it did was it took those files and just um, basically put them right into memory. So the graphics library actually does the decompression of the JPEG as it draws it, which makes it a little slow, which is again why I'd rather use PNG. Um, you can probably do bitmap, but the thing is bitmap isn't compressed at all and that's probably gonna take up a lot of memory, but it would be the fastest because it's just, just dump the pixels on the screen. Uh, yeah, okay, so it's basically pointing at that in memory. So yeah, let's go back over here. Yeah, there we go. There's the pointer right there. This should compile and run, so uh, let's compile and run it. All right, it compiled. Let's uh, send it over to the board. All right, it's programming. Hey, there we go. Check it out. <laughs> the speed at which it draws reminds you of like the 80s. Um, what well, if you think about it, like, JPEGs didn't used to load in, you know, instantly on computers. They'd be like, and this is uh, 200 megahertz, which is pretty good for a microcontroller, but compared to computers, that's like, what, 20, 20 years ago? All right, so let's do a little bit more with this. So I'm gonna go back in here. The reason we have to get the orientation working correctly is because if it doesn't, the text is always gonna appear vertically. So we want the text to appear horizontally. So we need to get the orientation thing working, but we'll get that figured out. Uh, let's go into embedded, this thing. Okay, let's get rid of hello world. We're gonna leave these. All right, redo the code. All right, I redid the code. Let's send it again. Hello world should disappear. Um, so a couple things to think about. This is uh, 480 by 272 resolution display, which is um, oh, about 130,000 pixels. However, we're running at 16-bit color, which means we need two bytes per pixel, which means 130,000 pixels requires 260,000 bytes of data. That's half of the RAM on this microcontroller. We still want to have like sound, program, some other things in it as well. So the challenge there is we can't have a double buffer. We basically have to draw it on the screen, which is why you see it updating. Now, if we had a double buffer, we could draw it in one buffer, then switch buffers, and then boom, it appears. However, if we wanted a double buffer, it would take up all of our RAM, which is not good. So we either need to draw the screen in such a way that it's not too intrusive when it updates itself, or we need to try to reduce it to eight bits per pixel, which means it would only take 130,000 bytes. Then we could do a double buffer and be back to where we were. So instead of having, let's, let's say two bytes per pixel, we have one byte per pixel, and then we use the RAM that we saved to double buffer it. So we draw it off screen, so to speak, and then boom, there it is. That's what double buffering means. And there's even triple buffering. And then in video games, they actually like draw the screen like five times before you even see it. Okay, uh, let's go into this. So what we could do is let's, for our final test, let's move it around. Okay, we're back in app. We're back in the main app file. So this is what our program can do. All the libraries are having fun behind the scenes, uh, but this is us. Okay, so I'm gonna have a counter. If counter increment is more than 500,000, counter equals zero, position increase. Okay, so now let's do a switch statement. Switch, position, okay. Oh no, it's case statements within a case statement. Okay, so there's a D1. So let's do this. Let's take that position file that we had. See how it has a name? Uh, image widget uh, two, three, four. Widget one is the background. Programming is like 90% copy paste and 10% actual programming. All right, let's just create some case statements so we can move the things around the screen. In case three, we will reset position back to zero. The reason we go to zero and not one is because once we loop around, it's gonna increment it again, which means it will go back right back to one. All right, so now we'll just cycle this down. We'll go uh, three, four, two, four, two, three. All right, so it's just gonna basically swap the positions every time it does a cycle. Now we didn't have to redo the harmony code because we're not changing the harmony code, we're changing our own code. And once you actually have the system working the way you want, you shouldn't have to reconfigure the harmony code. Hey look, it's cycling through, yay! It's not super fast because it's decoding all of these as JPEGs. All right, so to recap what we did, we use the PIC32MZ dev kit, and we were able to use a low-cost controllerless driver to drive an LCD using interrupt-driven direct memory access data transfers. Pretty cool. All right, we got the PIC32MZ to display custom graphics. I still need to read up on how this library works, but this is good news for our project. Well, Karen, we did it. We managed to get a microchip PIC32 MZ series microcontroller to drive an LCD without any additional hardware. Low cost controllerless. 
That was super easy, wasn't it, Ben? Didn't take hours and hours and hours of coding at all. Once you know what to do, it's straightforward. It's learning how it all works. That's the hard part. Oh, those darn libraries. Well, that's all the time we have for today. If you have any comments or questions about our Logic Gate board game builds, remember to check out that subspace on the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash TBHS. You can also go there to read about other upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. We'll see you next time. I used to kind of like him, but now he is a wimp. He's Crazy Horse's brother, though they had a different mother. Horse. Time to get inspiring wiring.